I'd like to thank the DSA and the Development and Change Journal for inviting me to give this lecture um, and look forward to putting something into the mix for the conference that we're in the middle of celebrating, enjoying here today. Now, the title of my paper is Sustainable Development in the Age of Contradictions. And it was 30 years ago uh, it was suggested that sustainable development was a concept fraught with contradictions and that it might be worth exploring some of them. I argued at the time, in 1987, a long time ago, that the term was employed to manage the contradictions between development on the one hand and sustainability on the other. Sustainable development might even be an oxymoron, I suggested. The idea of sustainability was borrowed originally from the natural sciences and historically deployed in two specific areas forestry and fisheries. For many, sustainability without the attached development was a robust trope of scientific investigation. And it remains so today, looking at journals like Sustainability Science, for example, which is quite a highly regarded science journal. This lecture, then, is an attempt to review these changes that have occurred in the last uh, 30 years or so, and to provide an assessment of where the ideas of sustainability and sustainable development stand today. Throughout human history, individuals and societies have been threatened by environmental change. So the Earth sciences make it clear that we are in the Anthropocene and that humankind is living in the age of climate change, a global and complex phenomenon that could undermine the stability of natural and social systems. At the same time, there are challenges to the way scientific information is understood and widespread skepticism about scientific knowledge. Hence the the media debate, and particularly in the press in this country or in, and in the United States. Public attention to environmental issues is often difficult to maintain, and the social media, which in some ways is so liberating and such a force for inclusivity and diversity, is also unpredictable and guided by subjectivity and assertion. So where does this leave the concept and practice of sustainable development today? What has happened to sustainability in the post-truth age? when science is subjected to public debate and scrutiny. Well, the concept of sustainable development was coined in the 1980s and became known uh, because of the Brundtland Commission's report in 1987 to meet contradictions in policy and practice and to square the circle of resource conservation and economic growth. If we look at the uh, outline of the principles of resource use and sustainability undertaken by Herman Daly, it summarizes roughly what, where we are, that, and we still are, and will remain, that the rate of use of renewable resources should not exceed the rate of their regeneration, that the rate of use of non-renewable resources should not exceed the rate at which sustainable alternatives can be developed, and finally, that the rate of emission of pollutants should not exceed the capacity of the environment to assimilate them. So those are the ecological principles at work. Now, sustainable development was one of several similar concepts which facilitated the management of divergent policy objectives at the time. In this case, environmental protection and economic development. To meet both environmental and development objectives meant responding to dual vulnerabilities, exposure to external risk occurring in nature and in structural conditions within and between societies, markets, prices, tenure, etc. And these are cumulative rather than competitive tendencies. So as a concept, it has been used to address both kinds of vulnerabilities. However, and here lies the first contradiction, the underlying problem was the Promethean, Promethean dilemma posed by Enlightenment thinking itself, which is how do we pursue human interests without destroying nature? Many of the life support systems which ensure human survival and continuity were being put at risk by human-made development. Predictably, the model which sustainable development drew upon was the policy accommodation already conceived in the first world, as it was called at the time. This was a hybridization of two separate policy discourses, the regulatory planning approach on the one hand and the pro-conservation discourse on the other. Um, so the vision was unashamedly anthropocentric in 1987, which remains so. It was also manifestly northern in its bias and created quite a lot of resistance in the global south. For most people at the time, nature conservation was seen it's difficult to imagine this, perhaps, but I think it's true generalization. Nature conservation was seen as a largely apolitical process. It wasn't really until the World Conservation Strategy in 1983 that nature conservation began to be seen as bound up with political forces, inequalities, justice, things of this sort. 
The immediate historical background to sustainable development was provided by earlier debates. The dominant concern, it should be recalled, was that we were reaching the limits of resource scarcity and resource capacity. During the 1970s, resource shortages were viewed as a constraint on further economic growth and development. The argument for resource conservation was thus that by conserving resources, we would be able to facilitate economic growth subject to natural limits. This was the, essentially the limits to growth position of the Meadows team, which had reported already in 1972. At the same time, existing levels of economic growth represented a threat to the environment and resources. It was argued that a vicious circle had been created in which economic activity undermined the biosphere resources on which we rely. So the first position, that better resource conservation facilitated economic growth, lost credibility partly because it was a product of high energy prices, the oil hikes of the 1970s. As hydrocarbons became relatively cheaper, and the effects of the Green Revolution expanding food staples to meet population growth began to be acknowledged, it was also clear that the Malthusian position no longer held. The population increased to exceed the resources necessary to feed this growth. And the drive for economic development in, in the South, circa the Brandt Report of 1980, was overtaken by events. It was overtaken events, first of all, put in jeopardy by the debt crises of the 1980s, the structural adjustment programs, and post-recovery, post-structural adjustment, the deregulation of markets and the retreat of the state. Eventually, higher levels of economic growth were experienced in much of the newly developed world, developing world, especially the populous economies of Asia but they did so at some cost to the natural environment. Now the second position, that the environment was not so much a constraint on development as a challenge to us to create an alternative kind of development, was labeled sustainable development. And the genius of this position was that almost everyone could sign up to it. There were at first very few dissenting voices that cast doubt on the intentions of development policy. The mechanisms which were unleashed via deregulation and the neoliberal ascendancy became the favored instruments of policy in seeking to achieve sustainable development. This is the period, remember, the Washington Consensus, so-called, a consensus, incidentally, in which most people had not been consulted. So seeking sustainable, to achieve sustainable development took two forms. First, attempts to internalize environmental externalities in products and services. The jargon spoke from the German of ecological modernization. This was viewed as a competitive strategy, especially by the European Union, giving Europe a competitive advantage over the United States and any newly developing rival. Basically, you can't embody carbon in products, seek to reduce energy and material throughput, and make a win-win gain by reducing energy costs, hydrocarbon prices were rising at the time, and reducing environmental damage. There's a quote here from Schumacher, early quote, it doesn't require more than a simple act of insight to realize that infinite growth of material consumption in a finite world is an impossibility. But then um, a more recent quote from the New Economics Foundation, dated 2009, so after the financial crisis that affected much of the world. In 2001, I'm re I'll read this because I know how annoying it is in an audience to have somebody put something up and then whiz on to their text. In 2001, approximately 5 billion tons of CO2 were embodied in the international trade of goods and services, most of which flowed from developing nations to developed nations. 5 billion tons excluded from developed nations' emissions inventories. This is greater than total annual carbon CO2 emissions from all EU 25 nations at 25 at the time combined. Rather than decarbonizing, the developed world has simply been outsourcing a significant proportion of its production with the effect of carbon laundering carbon laundering the economies of countries like the UK and the USA. So trade arrangements would also take account of embodied carbon. That was part of the idea behind ecological modernization. The more interventionist policies of the European Union facilitated this in the 1990s. Second, changes occurred with the development of carbon markets, both within industries and more importantly between countries. These new markets represented a challenge for entrepreneurship, provided new market opportunities, and required very little government action, which was a key attraction at the time. Carbon markets were thus popular among devotees of free market economics and environmentalism, unlike other interventions, such as carbon taxes. The awkward questions were not posed, however. Um, 
What might happen when markets fall and the price of carbon drops significantly? What are the wider ethical implications of trading in a bad pollution rather than a good? In institutionalizing, even normalizing the idea of carbon dependency. There's a quote from the Observer last week in the business section, which I've just pinned up. The conclusion, 3rd of September, must be that all the intellectual capacity expended on a capitalist solution to climate, this is the Observer talking about this, capitalist solution to climate change following Kyoto achieved no gain. Worse, it would appear that without carbon credits to shield corporate polluters, politicians would have come under pressure to devise a better system based on regulation. So, any latent opposition to carbon trading as a solution remained largely incohate in the rush to endorse it. Those who prioritized nature and were skeptical of economic growth as synonymous with development argued that nature could not be reduced to just another form of capital. Gradually, to a form, and I say this as a sort of footnote, but it's quite important, I think, a form of postmodern response developed, which was antithetical to the very idea of development perhaps not something which would uh, receive much support in this room, but there are such people in the social sciences, which parted company with the critical realism that characterized most development thinking. The variously defined cultural turn was to dominate much academic discussion of the environment in Europe, and particularly in North America in the from the 1980s onwards, and represented sustainable development, the concept itself, as a teleological fallacy. So the conversion of governments to an uncritical view of markets, the direction increasingly taken by mainstream policy, was even more evident in the international efforts to protect, quotes, biodiversity. The concept of the, bio, of the biodiversity regime was expressed in the Convention on Biological Diversity in 1992 and the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety in 2000. This demonstrated a shift from a focus on the loss of species diversity, and thus the loss of complex ecosystems, to a focus on the preservation of genetic diversity, where the principal gains were in the pharmaceutical industries and agriculture. Again, the almost imperceptible shift was from nature conservation to nature as commodity. The main opposition to the latter was from groups, largely third sector organizations, which argued that marginalized people had rights in nature themselves, which governments and the pharmaceutical industry ignored. However, the industry lobby won much of the ideological struggle, insisting that ex situ conservation in gene banks should be treated as equivalent to in situ conservation in ecosystems. This represented a second blow for those who emphasized the sustainability meant a balance between communities and their resources. Finally, the conjunction of newly liberated markets, in quotes, and environmental concern was clearly a necessary contradiction of capitalism that needed to be resolved. With hindsight and from a radical perspective, it required a managed senescence, if we continue with the biological metaphors of development. A more mainstream view, however, would be that recognizing the environmental consequences of liberal markets revealed system failures and could even lead to a rejuvenated, if scarcely recognizable, type of materials light capitalism. Um, let's see if we can give an example of this. Green capitalism, in effect. This is a, an ad taken the, by the Carbon Trust uh, Initiative. Sustainable development addressed issues of market failure, and only markets were equipped to provide solutions. The hopes that markets and technology would solve the environmental problems associated with accelerated economic growth and the enormous rise in global consumption and carbon emissions were about to be challenged, however, by several events, which you'll be familiar with. First of all, the financial crisis in much of the North. Now, this was a crisis fed by the personal greed of many bankers and financial managers and fueled by the virtually unregulated production of credit, not because interest rates were low, but because the price attached to housing equity, especially in the United States, United Kingdom, Spain, and Ireland, was unrealistically high. So the rise in subprime lending and borrowing took place under systems of ineffective financial governance, which emphasized everybody's right to property, regardless of collateral and debt levels. Politically, it was sold as everybody's right to credit rather than their right to debt. The irony was that the developed world had always berated governments in the South for their fin financial cupidity. The financial crisis revealed that the economic model itself was ultimately unsustainable. Although the policy response paid lip service to the rapidly disappearing green agenda, it didn't support the rhetoric with effective interventions. Um, and this suggested in the almost derisory 
role of new green investment in attempts to address the fiscal crisis. So the attempts to address the financial problems, particularly in the north, so you'll see here that there's a percentage, eco-friendly spending is a percentage in 2009 of total fiscal stimulus. In billions, it's very high in China, but as a percentage, it's very high in South Korea and China, but in Britain, Spain, Japan, Australia, Canada, it's extremely low. So no, little opportunity was taken at the time, which some people argued was important, to use the possibility of refinancing the, the international system by concentrating on green investment. There was now considerable evidence of the effects of the financial downturn on migration, as well as poverty, notably in China. China supported the United States debt through buying into its financial packages and supported raised consumption in the West generally by lowering the costs of manufactured goods there. The developed world came to depend as never before on the progress of the, quote, less, uh, unquote, less developed world, or more euphemistically emerging economies, especially the BRICS. This interdependency didn't end with financial markets. Another process that gathered speed in the 1980s and 90s was the transnationalized sourcing of food, minerals, and other resources. The internationalization of capital movements and the need to secure resources has led to increased transnational acquisition of land and minerals on the part of China and some of the Gulf states, principally in Africa. Rather than depend exclusively upon trade relations to meet their domestic resource deficiencies, trade contracts during an economic, contracts during an economic recession, the advantages of acquisition of land, acquisition of water sources, and food via virtual water became evident especially for their geopolitical reach. Land displacement for crops like soya had already changed international food land imbalances. So by the turn of the 21st century, the status of sustainable development had changed both as concept and practice. History, we were told, had ended with the breakup of the Soviet Union and the growth and penetration of globalization, not merely through neoliberal policy, but also through cultural diffusion. Third sector organizations adopted brands like profit-making companies and used internationally recognized logos and the gloss of celebrity to attract support and gain public recognition. It's an example in a coffee cup that I took the wrapper off one day on the train, Kenko Sustainable Development. Sustainable Development itself became branded where once local community groups couched their demands in the language of sustainability, the idea was taken up with alacrity by business. Recent research has explored the field dynamics that facilitated the emergence of a dominant understanding of business's role in sustainable development. Based on a study of the UN Earth Summits, it examines how actors meet regularly to battle for definitional control of what sustainable development means for business and what business means for sustainable development. Sustainability has graduated from scientific concept to dominant political narrative. The problem which most of this discussion failed to address was that of human agency. To quote Andy Dobson, what forms of human agency, innovation, and collective action lie outside the compass of entrepreneurship but help to still community support and engage environmental citizens? The neoliberal policy agenda sought to enable private actors to pursue their interests in ways that were more sustainable. The business of sustainable policy was to structure incentives, which in the case of northern consumers were called pre preference accommodation in the jargon. How can consumers be persuaded, as it were, to act more sustainably? There was an efficiency route to greater sustainability through industrial ecology, products and services, and appeals to behave more responsibly as consumers. It is striking that even by the standards of this logic, such an approach fails to answer the key question. This is, how do we reverse the path dependency that has characterized already developed societies? Rather than speak loftily of the need to transform human behavior, a start could be made by examining the world as it is. How is current behavior tied into systems of power through social institutions and physical infrastructure? How and why are social and economic structures unsustainable? What are the real costs of naturalizing the social practices which carry important environmental consequences? In a global world, this is as important in the South, I would maintain, as it is in the global North. I just witness to the need to fill up your bottle with water. I need refreshment, as suggested by the conference organizers. <clears throat> 
Very good suggestion. Second, by exploring material throughput, we confine ourselves to physical mass and the rate at which we use and replace renewable and non-renewable resources. Going back to the daily. What does dematerialization mean as a policy goal for the mass ranks of people who demand more materiality, especially in the emerging market economies? If societies are to manage the transition to greater sustainability, then the process of dematerialization must be examined from within a very different perspective. We certainly need to know whether waste matter is being reduced and throughput made more efficient, but also whether waste is simply being dispersed to new poorer spatial locations. There is a need to grapple with scale as well as materiality, with spatial relations as well as social relations. Similarly, several writers have argued that environmental injustice is a product of structural inequality as well as of pollution and, spe of, and species or habitat loss. Social and ecological resilience and forced migration are not merely different ways of accommodating to stress and uncertainty. They are often forms of resistance. They are the products of human agency. Ecological modernization, broadly conceived, has been the principal direction of travel for the sustainable development debate. It is a concept which has been captured by actors at several scales, localities and communities, national governments, businesses and international organizations. There is another counter-narrative, however, in the form of theories which emphasize the primacy of non-market relations. The emphasis on post-growth or degrowth as models of sustainability challenge the dominant narrative and introduce several linked ideas, ideas such as ecological debt, the role of deliberative institutions, and their relationship to models of growth. The concept of ecological debt has attracted attention from scholars and activists since the 1990s. The idea that nature is inexhaustible has allowed the idea of debt to be confined to the world of finance and balance sheets. However, more sophisticated environmental accounting emphasized the provision of environmental services in the form of clean water, for example, that make human livelihoods possible. Rather than view the relationships between the economy and the environment in terms of externalities, the conventional economic way, which could be internalized through prices, we might focus instead on the essential services which ecological systems provide. Taking more than is required of a finite resource and undermining ecological systems incurs a debt, and this debt was primarily in favor of the global south. To remove the distortions of the market requires a broad range of reforms, economic planning within known ecological limits and adopting a precautionary, precautionary approach. The valuation of natural capital implies rebalancing the trade between human economic activity on the one hand and the natural environment on the other. The second set of ideas complement this re-evaluation of nature and broaden both our understanding of science and the politics which surround it. As we have seen, market-based approaches to resolving the conflicts between nature and economic growth are based on the strength of intensity of individual preferences. They take little account of the reasons behind such preferences or the way in which they are transformed by social institutions. Deliberative democracy sought to reshape institutions to express wants and needs that are not catered for by the market. However, to be effective, deliberative institutions require much more equality in economic and social power and significant shifts away from current patterns of ownership and control. They take environmental problems solving away from consumer preferences and point towards citizen ownership. The problems with this agenda are not difficult to see. First is a condition of the success of deliberative democracy that societies achieve greater equality. Second, the tacit and practical knowledge that is reflected in deliberative processes needs to lead to effective political articulation. As most people in the field of development studies know, articulating concerns that lie outside conventional economic and scientific paradigms is a challenge. There is a massive translation cost in mediating between the supposed beneficiaries of development and the professional world of specialists. As O'Neill argues, conflicts around the development of new intellectual property regimes center on the control of knowledge crucial to innovation. The knowledge that fuels democratic, deliberative institutions will be highly contested. The attraction of widening our ideas about property and knowledge is that we include behavior and social relationships that are routinely ignored, such as public science, control of natural biodiversity, communal well-being, and bodily integrity. In addressing these domains, fundamental citizens' rights are increasingly under threat, since they are represented as potential spheres of market exchange and subject to new property rights regimes.
On the other hand, most post-growth theory remains poorly specified in policy terms and has only belatedly embraced workable proposals and a convincing narrative of transition, transition from where we are to a kind of post-growth or zero-growth age. Nevertheless, by prioritizing human needs and ecological limits over short-term economic gain, social injustice and growing inequality, post-growth theory demands our attention as an alternative to the mainstream. There have also been some useful forays into policy, including ecological tax reforms, the idea of a minimum income guarantee, and individual carbon budgets. At the societal level, these include new forms of grassroots organization, largely out of a response to the newly prescribed programs of austerity inflicted on most of the most vulnerable in much of the developed world. The leading premise of post-growth advocacy is that the consumption rates of the economically developed societies need to decrease disproportionately so that the population of the global south can enjoy an improvement in their material well-being. In a planet with finite resources, the present generation must develop, quote, a sense of obligation towards future generations. This can best be achieved by making a significant cut in the amount of time spent on paid work to reduce unemployment and distribute working time more evenly across the population. This would break the vicious circle in which we're engaged of working to earn and earning to consume and bring into play essential activities such as childcare, local volunteerism. In the developed world, the state can be the facilitator of these changes, bringing improvements in well-being. In the post-growth world, the misnamed welfare state would be forced from the shackles of the market economy and become the handmaiden of individual and communal well-being. One of the most challenging positions on growth has been called agnostic by its author. Drawing on her experience of development institutions and grassroots developments in the South, Kate Rayworth has argued convincingly that we are stuck with the structures of growth, uh, growth economics and we've lost the original goal that animated capitalism in the 19th and 20th centuries. A diagram of donuts economics you'll be familiar with. She employs the concept of salvage accumulation to characterize the process through which capital is accumulated without controlling the conditions under which commodities are produced. Sites for salvage are simultaneously inside and outside capitalism, she writes. This insight draws on numerous studies of localities and communities undertaken by development professionals and incidentally echoes some of the ideas first put forward by Rosa Luxemburg in a study of imperialism over a century ago. It is clear, however, that such a scenario is fraught with difficulties. Even assuming a political culture sympathetic to post-growth advocates, the achievement of the triple goals of sustainable development, that is, increased employment, improved well-being, and environmental conservation, requires a combination of measures to enhance regulatory compliance. Rather than improve local governance and the accountability of state institutions, measures to achieve the triple lock might leave poorer communities further from the instruments of power. Even Rayworth's donut economics rests ultimately on a we, on our ability to turn the corner out of conviction. Contrast this voluntaristic agency view with that of Thomas Piketty, another fashionable writer. For Piketty and like-minded scholars on the left, growing inequality is the outcome of the innate tendency for the rate of return on capital to outstrip the growth rate of the economy. The contradiction lies in the fact that challenging the inequalities of capitalist development can lead to greater state dependence and undermine agency. Finally, it is worth making a tentative link between these ongoing changes, which are often incohate from the point of view of the individual, and the new forms of 20th century populism, which you'll be familiar with. Right and left, Trump and Chavez as examples. <clears throat> these have grown from globalization and its perceived effects on the environment, jobs, and local communities. There is a process of disfran disenfranchisement of large groups of people in both North and South, faced by alienation from nature and the means, that is labor, work, with which it is transformed. And this is obviously fertile ground for illiberal populism. Increasingly, increasingly social marginality or exclusion is not simply ascribed by societies, but resented by those disaffected by the post-political consensus, as it's sometimes described. <clears throat> Political response has often been threatening to mainstream liberal values, including sustainable development. Rather than being a key element in democratic and accountable governance, the pursuit of sustainability is viewed by the populist right as a thinly disguised mantra 
which undermines the living standards of the working poor. There may, however, be hope, and this from an unlikely quarter, the utilization of computer algorithms for progressive ends. In the digital age, sustainability will increasingly be about the way people connect, <coughs> the options for connectivity. If algorithms help com companies and brands present us with choices that reflect our underlying commitments, then civil society and governments might use algorithms to enable more sustainable behavior. During and after the Second World War, a combination of government regulation and informal social control, most of the activity in the UK, for example, during the last war, much of the communal activity was not there because of regulation, but because of voluntary activities and voluntary groups. It's not often not fully acknowledged. Brought about profound shifts in individual and group behavior in the United Kingdom. The, 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 where the world we're back into trying to save cardboard, use more raw, raw materials much more carefully. <clears throat> but once the threat of invasion passed, and with it external threats to security, it was much more difficult to exercise social control Although shared experience of deprivation in the war and after the war and afforded a broad political consensus which still existed in the 1950s, late 40s and early 50s. The use of algorithms by global corporations today <coughs> allows social control to permeate from within the recorded patterns of behavior of individuals. So rather than look at regulatory mechanisms to control or suggest that we might tweak our behavior or nudge our behavior. We're looking at ways that actually work from within the recorded patterns of our behavior. So the very fact that I've come into this hall, of course, is entered into the algorithm of my behavior. And somebody, lots of people know what I'm doing, where I am and what I believe in, what I think, what I buy, how I perform. We perform within a pattern of behavior and response that is predictive accuracy. Might this lead to a radical departure by encouraging more sustainable behavior and development trajectories, especially if choices were presented not simply as market choices, but as political practices. For example, think of the growth of recycling websites and apps that facilitate the management of domestic energy consumption. There's the possibility of more social and political engagement, not less. And in the face of an exponential growth in data and information, this might represent a path encouraging collective action for sustainable principles which help to define the political instruments that enable us to change direction. So I'm arguing there's hope at the end of the tunnel, as it were. There's light at the end of the tunnel. In conclusion, what do we mean by the era of contradictions? I suggest three key processes. First of all, sustainable development had its origins in a specific set of historical circumstances. In Europe, the welfare state was based on an accommodation to capitalism that insulated social policy from the competitive pressures of the international market. However, the neoliberal project was to create a more integrated and open global economy, which minimized the barriers to capital and undermined the achievements of national states. We live with the effects of this contradiction in the North today, deregulated labor markets like those which have always prevailed in the global South, increased inequality, and via the digital revolution, a spatially remote political authority located in cyberspace. This authority is not the recognizable liberal consensus envisaged by the architects of the Brundtland Brundtland Commission 30 years ago. The world, or much of it, is using market transactions to define the physics of culture, shaping our world through computer algorithms. Power increasingly lies in the knowledge of predictability. Secondly, the second process, these developments have in turn led to a confusion about the loci of, la of radical change. Two opposing and contradictory impulses have dominated the political imagination of capitalism's critics. One tendency is to look to the state for solutions and consequently to seek to strengthen the powers of the state in responding to globalization. Another tendency, however, is to see the state as part of the problem. The challenge then is to build robust institutions within civil society as alternatives to the state itself. And there is a third contradiction of our times. The needs and wants of people are not set in stone but develop with the advances of technology and the market. New desires emerge which were absent from previous eras. Consider, for example, the implications of the exponential growth in Chinese domestic and international tourism for global resources, for transport networks, for the patterns of consumption. The demand side of the economy grows and is reshaped, while the conditions of scarcity persist and indeed grow more vulnerable in the ecological systems on which we depend. <coughs> 
Recursively, we return to the problem of scarcity and limits with which I began this lecture, except that now we can predict the precipice for which we're heading without arguably having a handbrake on the car, perhaps not a driver either. The recognition of what we've lost in the course of economic growth, notably the equilibrium mechanisms which often enabled nature to be resilient in the face of risks and shocks, have also led in different philosophical directions. On the one hand, to a shift from individualistic and anthropocentric to more bio and ecocentric positions. These often essentialist positions place nature above human well-being and indeed argue that fulfilling human aspirations is itself a threat to nature. Second, many radical green thinkers also argue that economic growth is the handmaiden of growing social inequality and powerlessness. This finds its clearest expression in the post-growth or degrowth arguments, which prioritize human welfare and the sustainability of ecological systems over short-run economic gains for privileged social groups. There is a potential problem here, though. As growth declines and inequalities increase, environmental pollution does not disappear, and the costs of environmental abatement are difficult to meet. The third process, which I've barely touched upon, is reserved for the new wave of populism, which has come to characterize much of the world today. This confuses skepticism about the ways that scientific knowledge is used with disbelief in post environment value of science per se. Assertion trumps argument and bigotry trumps evidence. The most, vivid play, the most vivid playing field for illiberal populism, as you will know, is that of climate denial, which still has plenty of apologists in the corridors of power. What do we want? Evidence-based science. At a time when gene economic coefficients show inequalities rising in many societies and ecological systems are often beyond repair, might sustainable development then as a concept be subject to renewal? Will the key ideas and inspiration be found in the hands of different political forces and forms of collective political expression? Or will it be abandoned as subject to solely algorithmic speculation and governance by the market? Can the idea of sustainable development be reinvented to accommodate the new exigencies of social and economic crisis and the vagaries of militant populism? What will become of the impending ecological Armageddon? Does the era of contradiction spell the end of sustainable development or a new beginning? The end of sustainable development or a new beginning? Which is it to be? Thank you. So you're asking, I'll repeat the question for the, this microphone. So you're asking whether um, the, the way of, best way of engaging with sustainable development today is to look at uh, w what can be done in terms of the existing agendas, what, what's happening currently, rather, uh, and in practical ways, in terms of the, the goal, international goals of sustainable development, rather than simply a sort of high theoretical discussion. Is that, is that fair? I'm sorry, if it's not, I'm, I'm just a bit, bit uh, drawn down. Uh, yes, I, I think it's always a conundrum, isn't it, how much one can seek to achieve at the local level or at the personal level and what one can achieve at the more organized level or by lobbying politically. I mean, it's a very difficult one. I think people are engaged in, through personal networks in all kinds of efforts of sustainability which probably didn't exist in 1987 when I wrote the book, or hardly, they existed in infancy. You know, I just got rid of a sofa and some chairs to the free cycle people in Canterbury, which I support. That's not unusual. Uh, I had a research student a few years ago who w w networked, did a sort of spatial diagram of all the groups to which she belonged, or people she knew to belonged, linked to everything from, you know, zero carbon to 
recycling to nature conservation. So I think at the personal level, these things probably, and for the younger generation, I think still uh, are very salient and very important. I think the problem is, uh, and other people have things to say about this at the conference, is linking the, the, the very real but apparently rather idealistic international goals, which are important but are difficult to translate into terms that people that understand in everyday life. Um, I think probably the best thing to do with sustainable development is think about what you think needs doing and then call it sustainable development rather than try and work out what sustainable development is. And there are plenty of examples of people um, operating locally as well as nationally to, uh, to try and address these problems. It's not a very adequate answer, but that's about as far as I can go. Uh, well, the, the, uh, 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 the question was, am I irrational in being optimistic? Um, well, whether you're irrational or, or not, I think it's a necessary irrationality because the problem, as you know, the, the problem with the whole sort of green agenda, particularly in the north, where it's more, more a luxury that people can afford more easily, is that you don't easily get elected by promising people a, a leaner, meaner life. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing to capture. Some people's imaginations are captured, but other people feel they're losing something. So I don't really see how you can put forward an idea like a more, more sustainable development without a, a measure of utopianism, really, with a measure of, 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 of optimism, certainly. Um, so I'm not too bothered about whether it's irrational. I think you may be right. I mean, looking object as objectively as one can at the world, particularly the breakdown of the Paris uh, Agreement and so on, one has to be very pessimistic, quite pessimistic. How long these trends will last in the United States is another matter. Um, whether we can regalvanize the kind of energy that can exist and does exist in civil society for more sustainable ways of living, there's lots of evidence that we are, or learning from other countries and other cultures. So I wouldn't say that you, it's necessarily I irrational to, to be optimistic. It's very difficult to be optimistic. The problem is there's no real alternative, you know. Um, and of course, that, that bears its own consequences because if, you, if people think that, they, you know, we're, we're, we're going to hell anyway, they'll go on, you know, buying big cars and consuming more fuel or, you know, going further to buy their food or, you know, uh, convert more vegetable protein into animal protein. I mean, all those things will become worse because people think there isn't a solution. There's no way out. We might as well, you know, spend, get and spend while we're here. I think the really difficult thing, in a way, um, to take up the part of what you were saying, perhaps part of the early question, um, is the idea of intergenerational equity, you know, the idea of what we owe to future generations. Um, because people are aware of it, I think, in certain stages of their life, you know, when you have children, or in my case, grandchildren. But it's not an easy thing to communicate politically. It's not an easy thing to communicate the value of it. So that you actually look, I mean, a good example is the kind of cuts in, the, the, in green, uh, green policy interventions that the last government undertook. Uh, there was quite a lot of evidence in the, in the papers this morning that had the, um, the, the subsidies and helps, assistance given to more sustainable kinds of energy production in Britain being maintained instead of cut, we would have been around the corner and doing rather well. Just as we did with, uh, with, uh, with um, wind power, for example, in the early stages. We sold the technology or other people exploited it more than us. But there's a lot of evidence that if you stick to your guns and you go into those things, then you will get there. But it does require perhaps a, a leap of the imagination. I wouldn't say it was irrational, but a leap of the imagination to think about what will happen in 20 years' time or, or 40 years' time, 50 years' time. And I'm probably too old to be the best judge of whether people have that today, you know, whether that... Um, various things, not least the Brexit vote, if I'm being controversial, suggest to me that there is hope amongst the younger generation. <laughs> Um, but not people over 65. <laughs> the other question? Yeah. Yes, the other question, um, uh, how, could, how to summarize it? You, uh, sustainable development goals and the part that the North and South play in achieving them, um, and the ease with which they can achieve them. I think I agree, really, with what you were saying. I think I feel that uh, it, it's a very uneven ship really, uh, who, you know, it's, 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 it's that, that was the, I think the main argument you're putting forward. Perhaps I didn't quite grasp it, but that seemed to be the point. 
but I think that, um, uh, you know, again, sustainable development goals are something you need to translate into people's consciousness, aren't they? And it's very difficult to do that. I don't think I'm particularly good at it. This sort of paper doesn't particularly do it. But uh, I always think one of the most sustainable people I ever met, knew, met, knew was my mother, uh, who's long since died, long since passed away, who, you know, because of wartime experience, looked after her car, uh, paper bags and paper clips and looked and reused things, not just recycled them, but reused them all the time. Saw food waste as completely unnecessary. So I think in a way, um, rather than look just to new technologies and new digital constructions, which I'm partly arguing in the paper, may be very useful, we might also look to the kind of practices that we've discarded that are no longer thought of as very modern in the North. But those practices in the South, as you'll be very aware, are often very, very current. You know, what do people do with waste? They reuse it very often. It becomes part of a small industry or small entrepreneurship, small market activity. It's a, it's a paradox I touched on in the paper that, in fact, um, many of the things that seem to be new or challenges to the, 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 the global north are already very well known and very well worked out in the global parts of the global south. Well, I think we're seeing divisions, hence the populist rise. We're seeing major divisions, sort of structural um, inconformity and, and, uh, and, and stress in some of the big economies of the north as well. Thanks, Mark. Um, my question is a bit overtaken by the question of my colleague previously, because I was wondering how in, um, to achieve this sort of, to, to, to sort of tilt towards a kind of post-growth paradigm, as you said, okay, I can see the role of civil society, but do you see a role at all for the sustainable development goals in the United Nations? Right, uh, well, I'm one of from the University of Reading, and uh, my, my question relates slightly to that as well, because you touched on the agency aspect, but I want to focus on the structural aspect, and uh, particularly the regulatory structure against the sustainable development goals, and also sort of comparing the other structures, global structures. Uh, for example, uh, some of the UN Security Council resolutions requires countries to specifically report periodically on certain issues like global war on terrorism. Resolution 1337, Resolution 2068 requires specific reporting. Why have we sort of, is it possible to pressurize to having a resolution which are more binding rather than what we currently have is more voluntary and advisory nature of resolutions where uh, commitments and treaties where countries are just committing themselves. Uh, is it a failure of having uh, enough push towards that kind of regulatory regime, global regulatory regime, in which uh, the politicians will talk uh, alongside that how much percentage of your uh, budget should go on nature spending, and also a similar way they'll take how much budget of your, uh, how much percentage of your budget should go for sustainable development of issues. Uh, do you see that kind of a pressure to be the right direction uh, to address this issue? Yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, I was interested, you were talking about the history of sustainable development and how, you know, it's been quite a long time um, as, a, as, a, as a phrase, as a concept, as a framework. Um, but a lot of the climate community now talk about um, climate compatible development and climate resilient about development. And I wonder whether you, you know, how you relate those of what you think or whether you've got to make any comment about a sort of reframing, if you like. Um, I know that um, climate compatible development, for instance, includes adaptation to climate change, mitigation, and um, you know the, the idea is that these are brought into development theories. Yes, uh, the, thanks very much. There's the three questions there. The first one was about the, the, the sustainable development goals. Is it a point to having international goals? I think. Um, well, I think there is a point in, in. I can't see there's any benefit by not having them. But I think that terms like sustainable development have often functioned uh, 
to uh, help articulate things that were not previously looked upon in those terms, so that people had people of squatter settlements in Buenos Aires, you know, the people or areas of urban poor, and they were able to frame their problems in terms of sustainable development. So one of the ways that it's quite useful to have goals, even at the international level of the kind of UN goals, but certainly is, is to give a kind of credence, a kind of validity to the things that people do at the local level, because they're reflected, mirrored, in rather grand, rather grandiose perhaps, international goals. So I think for that reason alone, there is some merit in that. Um, so that, you know, the, the struggles that people have to achieve, which may be very incoherent, but achieve development in a sustainable way, are actually echoed in the corridors of power. The second question was really about whether voluntary agreements, as I understood it, can work. Um, I, you know, how far one can adopt a kind of properly regulatory capacity at the international level, you know, things that, that bite, terms that people sign up to that will work. Um, I, the, I, not a field I know an awful lot about. There are other people here like Owen Green who know more about it. But I would say, um, you know, that is the problem, isn't it? The Lynch key. So much uh, enthusiasm was put into the Paris Agreement, certainly into some of the other COPs at the intervals. And that enthusiasm, one doesn't want to dissuade people or make little of that enthusiasm and that energy and, and sets feeling of some success, but then looked in the hard light of day or next morning so much does rest on voluntary agreements. I don't know how it could not rest on voluntary agreements. We don't, we don't have the kind of sanctions the World, World Trade Organization has, for example, to manage trade in ways that uh, it can imply sanctions for countries that break the rules. Whether one could adopt such rules that involve sanctions, I'm, I'm unsure. But that was the, the, the measure, I think, of what you were saying. Um, now, uh, the final question. Um, I, think, I think one of the difficult things, I think you can always think of a term. I, at the time sustainable development was invented, there were other terms like eco-development doing the rounds. That you can always think of terms. And I think sometimes it's useful because it helps to conceptualize things. Things that are going on need a kind of framework of understanding. So the, there's no harm in having concepts. But as I said earlier, I think the real problem lies in translating that into things that are tangible or things that people can can work to or can try and aspire to. And I, I, I'm not sure how, I'm, I can't say that these new ter these terms you mentioned have particularly done that. Um, I, I think I'm always a bit worried. I was a bit worried, for example, if I may be a little controversial here, about Al Gore's film, because I think he's a good man and he's on the right side of the argument. And I, I really do respect him for that. He's gone out of his way for many years to push the boat out. But I thought the film lapsed in some serious ways that reflect on your on your question, really. Um, first of all, there was very little on the, about the demand side. There was very little about what drives consumption, what drives energy use. We had lots of natural disasters as a consequence of climate change, quite rightly featured in the film, very dramatically. And we had quite a lot on things like solar energy. But when I came out of the film, I was disappointed that, in fact, we were disempowered. There wasn't much other than adopting more solar energy and other kinds of energy you know, technologies. It was very much a technological solution, really. It didn't seem to relate very closely to the, the getting and spending of everyday life everywhere and the kind of way that one's on an escalator there, you know, and the implications of that. Um, so I was a bit disappointed. The other thing that disappointed me about the film, which I want to say I think has real merit, I mean, any documentary that, that, that gets a climate deniers and makes the case for considering climate change as an overarching issue gets my support. But the other thing I thought was missing was anything about other species. And one of the great things that's happened since 1987 is that people are aware to different degrees of their responsibility for other species, you know. I'm taking these things with me, not just pandas, but the rest, you know. Whole habitats, invertebrates, not just cuddly animals, you know, we're taking them with us. And that seems to be a massive responsibility. And the growth of interest, not, not in freaky, ecocentric uh, development, but, you know, quite well thought out implications for diet, for food, for habits, uh, regarding the animal world particularly as having great importance. It seemed to me that was, the, the documentary didn't touch on that at all. It was as if we were, it was purely an anthropocentric reading of climate change. And I thought that was disappointing. But as I say, it's easy to say what's wrong with something. The point is it's got into cinemas, it's been streamed all over the world, um, and I admire much of what he represents.
but I, that reflects a little bit on what you, what you asked, which I can't really answer very thoroughly. On that uh, optimistic, ecocentric note, I think this will go this far. We think thank you very much once again. Um.